Hey there, interwebs. If you asked a monotheist why bad things happen to good people, they'd probably tell you God works in mysterious ways. If you posed this same question to an ancient Greek, they'd say, What do you expect? God's a drunken swan rapist, and I wish any part of that were exaggeration. So with the gods being morally fast and loose atop Mount Olympus, it's only natural that some innocent bystanders got caught in a crossfire and turned into horrible monsters. We may remember them these days only as what they became, but I'd like to shine some light on who they once were. These are my five most misunderstood villains. I heard that groan. The good news is the puns can only improve. Number five, Asterion, aka the Minotaur. We all know about the Minotaur. He was a half-bull, half-man who lived at the center of Daedalus's labyrinth on the Isle of Crete until Theseus came along and killed him with a magic sword. That's just the end of his story, though, not the beginning. It starts with his stepdad, King Minos. Minos competes with his brothers to rule and prays to Poseidon to send him a white bull as a show of support. I'm not sure how possession of melanin-deficient livestock correlates to leadership ability, but that's what he does. After taking the throne, Minos is supposed to sacrifice the bull to honor Poseidon, but he thinks the bull is too pretty and substitutes one of his own. Of course, Poseidon's not some have-it-your-way bistro and doesn't accept substitutions when it comes to steak. He's got beef with King Minos and decides to exact some poetic justice. If Minos thinks this bull is so beautiful, so can his wife, Pasiphae. Poseidon essentially mind-controls her into finding the bull attractive, some things happen involving history's first recorded fursuit and suitable only for fur affinity, and shortly thereafter Pasiphae's got a new baby calf thing. She names it Asterion, meaning star, but when she attempts to breastfeed it, that doesn't really work. Being a hybrid of man and beast, civilization and wilderness, Asterion has no natural food source and is forced to eat humans for sustenance. Essentially, Minos pissed off Poseidon, who decided to take it out on the king's wife and future kid, which is kind of a dick move when you think about it. The god of the sea didn't much truck with the sins of the father philosophy. Asterion was just the product of divine vengeance, less malevolent and more driven mad by the existential dread of being of two worlds. And hangry. Saying he was completely evil, though, is a load of bull. Number four, Scylla. Although it's quite likely you've heard of this six-headed sea monster, it's probably only for her work with Charybdis. Much like Lennon and McCartney, your pizza and pineapple, they did their best work together, but this doesn't mean she didn't have a solo career of her own. Scylla first appears in the Odyssey as part of a sadistic choice the eponymous hero must make. Does he sail closer to her, knowing she will definitely eat six of his men, or does he bear towards Charybdis and risk losing his entire ship? Spoiler alert, it's the first one. Here, she is little more than just another obstacle in Odysseus's way home, a guaranteed death sentence for half a dozen Greek seamen, but later myths give her what every good comic book villain desires. No, not world domination, a sympathetic backstory! Metamorphoses is an early 1st century AD narrative poem by the Roman writer Ovid, created about 700 years after the Odyssey. According to him, Scylla was once a beautiful young nymph who caught the eye of Glaucus, a fisherman who ascended to godhood after eating some magic herbs. Unfortunately for our apotheosized Achaean angler, the feeling isn't mutual, and Scylla is so repulsed by his fishy appearance that she flees to her local promontory where he can't follow and refuses to leave. Man, I wish I could say that's never happened to me. Despite his former profession, Glaucus is apparently unfamiliar with the saying there's plenty of fish in the sea, and he isn't the kind of guy who lets a little thing like women being physically ill and fleeing the area stop him. His backup plan involves visiting Circe and asking her to do him a solid by brewing a special love potion to give to Scylla. I know the majority of these Greek romances involve slipping things in people's drinks when they're not looking, but I must have missed that part in the Odyssey where Circe's dealing in Molly. Molly I remember, but not Molly. Anyway, Glaucus's foolproof plan to score with an intoxicated chick hits a snag when Circe actually sees him. Rather than be disgusted and run to the nearest geological formation like the last girl, though, she falls madly in love with the fishman, just proving that there's someone for everyone out there. Sadly, it'd be several millennia before Love the One You're With would be written by 20th century poets Crosby, Stills, and Nash, so Glaucus only has eyes for Scylla. Since women in these myths are universally jealous and spiteful, Circe brews a poison instead, which transforms Scylla into the terrifying monster we know today. In John Keats' loose retelling of the story, Circe doesn't bother with the whole potion thing and just straight up murders Scylla instead. In the world of Greek gods, love triangle was basically a synonym for at least one of us is going to die or become a monster. So, was she a monster who ate a bunch of sailors? Yes, eventually. Was that her fault? No. The only thing she did in the whole story was exercise her right to say no, but as Ted Haggard learned to his cost, people don't easily forget your habit of swallowing loads of semen. Number three, Arachne. These days, Arachne is most commonly remembered as either a god-tier braggart or a monstrous spider lady. Or both. To be honest, though, both are mostly true. According to Ovid's Metamorphoses, Arachne was a shepherd's daughter who started weaving at a young age and got really freaking good at it. She starts boasting that her loom game is even stronger than that of Athena, goddess of arts and crafts. 
Athena, having the powers of a god and the tolerance of a toddler, won't stand for some trash-talking upstart honing in on her game, so she disguises herself as an old woman and approaches Arachne. Old woman Athena tells Arachne she's got nothing on the gods and to plead for Athena's forgiveness. Arachne responds, saying that if Athena's got something to get off her aegis, she can come say it to her face. Athena immediately drops the disguise and the two of them throw down like it's eight mile with tapestries. When they're finished, Athena's weaving depicts four separate scenes of contests where the gods smack down mortals for their hubris. I said she was the god of arts and crafts, not subtlety, okay? Arachne's work, on the other hand, is a beautiful collage of the countless ways the gods, particularly Athena's dad Zeus, have misled, tricked, seduced, and abused their mortal followers. You see, Arachne talks a big game, but she isn't writing checks her soon-to-be hairy abdomen can't cash. She has the skills to back it up, and the chutzpah to call out the gods on their dickishness at the same time. She was essentially the Edward Snowden or the Upton Sinclair of her day. When Athena sees that Arachne has objectively defeated her while simultaneously insulting her dad, she throws a total shit fit, destroying Arachne's weaving and magically transforming her into a spider woman for the rest of her days. Yes, Arachne was a braggart, but not unjustifiably so. She just made the mistake of pissing off the palace petulance. Number 2. Hades. Being god of the underworld, Hades has over time become associated with death, evil, Satan, and hell, with his name even becoming a synonym for the latter. In the Nick Cage film Drive Angry, which everyone should watch if only once, the accountant describes the devil as follows, quote, Satan is simply the warden of a very large prison. Quiet man, actually. Thoughtful and he's well-read, and I happen to know the idea of sacrificing children in his honor annoys him greatly." Unquote. This isn't terribly accurate to the classical depiction of Satan, but it's shockingly close to the true characterization of Hades. In myth, his most remarked-upon characteristics are how level-headed, reliable, and dedicated he is, and how boring all the other gods find him because of it. He could be moody and manic at times, but in general, as long as you did right by him, he'd treat you fairly. He only got his job as king of the underworld by drawing the short straw with his brothers Zeus and Poseidon. Hades was a lot like Hermes. No, not that Hermes, the other one. Yes, that one. He's a lawful neutral bureaucrat, not some chaotic evil avatar of death and torment. That'd be Martin Shkreli you're thinking of. The worst thing he did was kidnap his future wife, but that was just kind of how the gods proposed back then. Plus, when you compare that to his brother's usual antics of obtaining dubious consent at best and bailing faster than you can say immaculate conception, Hades is a bastion of civility. Most of us also know that Hades trapped Persephone in the underworld for half the year by offering her some pomegranate. He grew that himself. Hades has a garden where he grows fruit, and his Roman equivalent Pluto carried keys representing his capacity to give humanity the agricultural wealth of the year's fruits. Hades is a veggie gardening suburban dad. Speaking of Persephone, he's faithfully devoted to his wife, and he's one of the few gods who can truthfully say that. When Orpheus wants him to bend the rules, Hades is like, sorry dude, but we got rules for reasons, but eventually relents and gives Orpheus the easiest conditions in Greek myth because Persephone asked him to was a favor. Yes, dear, really doesn't cover it. For his twelfth and final labor, Heracles was tasked with capturing Hades' hellhound Kerberos. I'm aware that most people pronounce it Cerberus, but in Greek it's spelled with a kappa, not a sigma. That being said, the pragmatic definition of a name is whatever people call something, so if most people call something a certain term, that's its name. I say Kerberos because it's more historically accurate, just like Heracles compared to Hercules, but let's not get too picky about these things. We all know I'm talking about Hades' three-headed pooch. As another aside, one possible origin of the name is the Proto-Indo-European word Kerberos, related to the Sanskrit word Sarvara, meaning blotchy or spotted. It's entirely possible Hades named his dog Spot. That is not the act of an evil man, it's the act of a slightly boring nerd. Anyway, Heracles is supposed to steal Kerberos, which will piss off Hades. Instead, Heracles just walks up to Hades and is like, Yo dude, can I borrow your dog? And Hades is all like, Sure dude, he could use a walk, just don't hurt him and take some bags in case he craps on the road. The only people Hades really screwed over were Theseus and Pirithus, who tried to kidnap Persephone for themselves, disrespecting both the bro code of not taking another guy's girl, and the concept of calling dibs. Hades kidnapped her first, fair and square. Despite this, Hades even lets Heracles take Theseus out with him when he picked up Kerberos, since kidnapping Persephone was Pirithus's moronic idea and Theseus was just helping out his bro. All things considered, Hades is a perfectly reasonable guy who loves his wife and does his job, and he sure as hell doesn't deserve the baggage we've heaped on him over the years. Number 1. Medusa. You know Medusa, the gorgon with snakes for hair and a face so ugly that anyone who looked directly at her turned to stone. She was a wicked and hideous fiend, eventually slain by Perseus and had her head unceremoniously repurposed as a portable petrifier, an eventual shield cozy for Athena. According to Metamorphoses, yes, that again, Medusa was once a ravishingly beautiful young woman and, quote, the jealous aspiration of many young suitors. 
Unquote. So what happened? Well, just like Arachne, she earned Athena's wrath. What was her crime, though? What transgression could be so heinous, so wicked, so reprehensible as to warrant such a severe punishment as hers? Brace yourself. She had the sheer temerity, the very audacity, the absolute gall, to be raped by Poseidon in Athena's temple. Yeah, have you noticed yet how I keep pointing out what massive dicks the gods were? If you thought Hera was a victim blamer whose husband couldn't keep it in his toga, you ain't seen nothing. Athena's uncle forces himself on a woman in the goddess's temple, and being just as vindictive as she was with Arachne, Athena decides to take it out not on the actual offender, but on his unwilling victim, and just to add insult to injury, she later mounts the poor woman's head on her shield. Athena, Greek goddess of weaving, wisdom, warfare, and being a petty bitch. If you enjoyed this video, you probably like my slightly snarky writing style or the idea of examining elements of classical mythology and fantasy with a modern lens. The good news is, there's more where that came from in my detective novel Steve Knight, Paranormal Investigator. It also has minotaurs, nymphs, and thonic entities, and no one gets sexually assaulted. It's linked in the description, along with the rest of my ebooks. Why not pick one up to show your support for my work of providing you with free entertainment? Thanks for watching, and have a nice day. Zeus really is the patron deity of office Christmas party fiascos, adultery, paternity tests, and turning into poultry to pork some beef. So Hades abducts Persephone, daughter of Zeus, and dude, I don't know why you thought kidnapping Liam Neeson's daughter was a good idea. It didn't end well for anyone in Taken or Ponyo. Of course, I don't know why they gave that role to Neeson. I would have offered it to Ron Jeremy. I'm pretty sure Orpheus actually wrote Total Eclipse of the Heart. Turn around. Kerberos was definitely a pit bull. Bad reputation, cuddly knucklehead. Er, heads. Buy my freaking books! Give me money!